Strategy. Design. Marketing. UX. Digital. Development. This is Agencies That Build. This show is dedicated to leaders and teams that design and deploy in the digital world. My name is Jesse, and I'm a marketer and an agency owner. And I'm Varun. I'm not a marketer, but a coder and an agency partner. This show is sponsored by Together We Ship. On a mission to help agencies grow. All right, rock on. So we're here. Varun, hi. How are you? What's new? What's shaking? Oh, I'm, I'm great. I'm doing well. I'm so excited for the summer. A lot of trips planned with little ones. So very, very exciting days coming up. I'm so ex- happy to also meet our today's guest, um, which you'll do an intro, but I had the opportunity to listen to her a few years ago uh, as a speaker in one of the events um, where she talked about digital transformation, what it is and what or what it is not. So that was pretty cool. But um, yeah, go ahead. Let's, let's start the intro. So you've had a sneak preview then on our guest. All right. So our guest, as you may have heard, is a keynote speaker. She is the author of Work Like a Boss, a kick in the pants guide to finding and using your power at work and a recipient of numerous awards and recognitions, including the most admired CEO from Minneapolis St. Paul Business Journal, Journal, uh, Business Owner of the Year from National Association for Women Business Owners. She was a panelist at the inaugural White House Summit for Working Females in Washington, DC. So we're gonna, I am gonna ask you some questions about that. Um, She was featured on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt in the segment titled Best Place to Work in America. That's a pretty big one right there. Co-founder and CEO of Clockwork Interactive, Nancy Lyons. Welcome to our podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Well, there's a lot of stuff that I, I've, we've teed up to kind of chat with you with, but in traditional, in our traditional way, let's start off with the myth you'd like to bust, some sort of misconception, bogus strategy, something that you'd like to set the record straight on. What do you got cooking? What, what do you want to clean up? Clear. Oh, great. I'd like to bust the American dream. I don't think it's real. I don't think it's true. I think it's a fairy tale that we tell people. I mean, I think certainly hard work and perseverance work for some people, but I also think it helps to be white. It helps to have access to networks of people that can support you. It helps to have access to capital. It helps to have, you know, a head start, an affluent family. Um, There's all sorts of things that actually uh, fuel that American dream for people that achieve it. And I think that we give people the wrong impression, the wrong idea, and we disappoint a lot of folks. And I think we have to shift um, you know, our capitalist way of thinking about what success looks like and how it can be achieved in our country. So I think if I were going to bust any myth, it would be that one, because I think it also puts a lot of pressure, you know, the self-talk stuff that we put on ourselves about what level of success we should have achieved by now. Um, I think it's all garbage. And then it creates, you know, situations where we compare ourselves to other people, other leaders, other companies, and comparison is the thief of joy. So I, uh, I think the American dream is a myth and I'm out to bust it. Love it. I, I just, I, I, Both of us are speechless. I'm looking at Varun's face and he's, I can see him processing and I'm processing. I, this is a great myth, Uh, you know, as uh, it it, coming out of the year, I'm going to totally go meta right at the beginning of this coming out of coming out of last year. There's a lot of people and I don't know about you guys, but I've had a lot of conversations with people about what does life look like? And I don't mean that like, what is growth and people and, you know, like growing things. I mean, like how to be able to design the life that you want to live and what does that look like? And I think that ties really nicely into your busting of the American dream, because think about the rise in van life. I wouldn't be surprised to see, not that I want to live in a van that's, you know, I, I'm I, beyond that point in my life at this point you know, moment, but I'm, there's no judgment, do what you got to do. But the idea of being able to build a life and live on the road and, you know, it just is completely blown up over the past year to be able to kind of live this way. That's, you know, even that nomad land, that's the name of it, right? The Oscar. Yeah. Wilde, yeah. Nomad land and the concept of that and how to be able to function. I just, there's so much here. Um, that was yeah. a lot of half sentences. Varun, did you have a thought? <laughs> No, it's an interesting myth uh, to to burst because um, 
Yes, it could go either way um, for, for many. I mean, um, I'm an immigrant. So when we, people coming from different countries, when they come and come to this country, that's what they think about, like um, American dream, you know, land of opportunities and all that. But when you come here, you see the realities. For some, yes, we, people have seen successes and then there are failures. So um, it, 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 it's an interesting myth to, to smash. So I, I would like to you know, learn more and uh, you know, hear some more experiences from, uh, from you, Nancy. And, uh, what, tell us some stories, give, give us some examples of where you think um, it works and where it did not. Well, I think you know, we, um, we have a lot of, we're, we're pretty enamored in the business world with startup culture. And yet the startups that we celebrate and we find ourselves talking about a lot are very well funded. They're also generally white um, and male. Um, and I think we're seeing a move away from that. You know, certainly right now there's, there's I think pressure on mainstream culture to think differently, look differently and, and, and act differently. But you know, when we talk about the success stories in our culture, we, we look at Mark Zuckerberg, we look at, um, you know, Elon Musk, we look at these white, you know, and Mark Zuckerberg, you know, let's, let's not fool ourselves. You know, he, he was a white guy from an affluent family going to Harvard. So, you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's kind of interesting when, when we think about what we celebrate and we rarely talk about, it's sort of like, you know, to your point, Jesse, about van life. I think, or, you know, RV, the, all the RVs that are being renovated and people are driving around in those, like to somebody that's a definition of success, but we celebrate money. We celebrate capitalism and, you know, and the stories that we celebrate in business are big, you know, they're, they're, um, they're, they're, they're generally massive. We don't celebrate you know, small companies that were bootstrapped where people made livings for themselves and then were able to extend those opportunities to other people and never went outside for cash and never grew to any, you know, enormous um, size, but were steady and profitable and ethical and contributed to their communities. We don't hear about those companies. We don't talk about those companies. We don't shine lights on them. So when we talk about the American dream, we're not talking about, you know, again, we're not talking about people in RVs who are choosing to give up what they know and explore the beauty in this country. We're talking about people who make a lot of money at all costs. And I, I sort of feel like, you know, again, to your point, over the last year, we've had a chance to really think about what our values are as individuals in the context of the organizations we're involved with. You know, what are our values? How are we living them? And I don't know that the American dream, the story we've told ourselves, you know, since, you know, at least the industrial revolution, um, I don't know that it applies anymore. I think people are recognizing that there's complexity in that that maybe isn't for them. And that even subscribing to, you know, big corporate values may not be for them. And, and actually money doesn't define us. Um, and it's sad because in a capitalistic society, it almost has to because we need it in order to survive. Um, but how much do we really need? And, um, and, and, and actually where can we put our energy to be defined in different and richer ways? There's a lot there. And I yeah. think the direction I wanna go with this is let's start with your story. You know, oh. let's start with how, you know, with our audience. So the idea of, yeah, let me just, let me ask the question. The question, let's start with your story. How did you become an agency co-founder? You know, where does that, whether was it a dream it did it no. start with you know so it's it's a common uh, yeah tell us your story and we'll, we'll go from there how about that <laughs> yeah well i you know i it's interesting because the the bureau um you know i i at bureau events i often find myself talking to other entrepreneurs about how we're all accidental entrepreneurs you know, it's like, how did the, like, how did this even happen? Was this what you were heading for? Nobody, you know, what little kid when they're 10 gets asked what they want to be when they grow up and, 
you know, who, which one says, I want to be an agency owner. I want to grow up and build a consultancy or a technology firm and serve corporate clients. <laughs> like, you know, they, they say doctor, fireman, policeman, um, you know, astrophysicist, whatever, but nobody says what we do. And, uh, you know, I, I think, um, I think, I also think that that's part of the myth busting for the American dream in that um, most careers happen by accident, but that's not the story we're told, right? We're told if you go to school and you pursue that major and you follow a path and you work hard, you'll have the career you chose when you were 10 or 15 or whatever. Nobody talks about the gap years and the flunking out and the, you know, the uncertainty and the years where you waited tables or you know, worked four jobs to pay for school. And um, that was my story. I, I was a theater major in college. I never thought in a million years that I would, um, that I would be involved in technology or technology consulting. Um, I thought I was gonna, in fact, I remember my freshman roommate when we got assigned to each other, she looked at me and she said, what do you think you're gonna do when you're done with school? And I said, oh, I'm gonna be on Saturday Night Live, like for sure. I'm going to be, you know, the chubby chick on Saturday Night Live. Um, and uh, that was ridiculous to my parents and ridiculous to her. I don't think she talked to me again after that. Um, but uh, I really thought that I was going to be a comedian. And that's, you know, it, it's interesting because that's another thing about the American dream. Our culture doesn't value those sorts of career paths. We're starting to more and more. But if you actually say that, you know, that's bizarre and everybody looks at you like, I'm sorry, you'll never be able to pay your rent. Um, so I thought, you know, following a performance uh, interest was the way I wanted to go. And I did that for a long time. I got out of school. I worked in dinner theater. I tried to do stand up. I waited a lot of tables for a long time. And um, and then I. Uh, I worked for a community, I was doing um, traditional media. So marketing videos um, and, uh, um, and corporate videos, training videos, that sort of thing. And my job was lousy. I actually um, remember working in a communications firm that produced those sorts of videos and just being sort of mistreated. You know, I was the person who had to be there at five in the morning organizing the props and getting coffee for people. And dudes who had less experience than me um, were given, you know, sweeter assignments and treated better. And I thought, God, and there were no women directors. There were no women behind the cameras. And I would go get, you know, my boss's dry cleaning and his pick his children up from daycare. And I thought, oh God, this is my life. This is what my life's good. And then after that, I would have to go wait table someplace to make ends meet. And I, I thought this is what my life is going to look like. And so I remember teaching myself um, how to hand code HTML. And then teaching myself, you know, I bought a, I, I bought a book. So that tells you something. Um, I bought a book on Pearl and I was trying to teach myself how to code in Pearl because it was a long ass time ago. And, um, and I, you know, I, what, it, what it gained for me was a theoretical understanding of how the, the, the technology worked. And I was, I was never going to be a programmer, not ever in a million years. But at least I understood how it brought things together and made stuff function. And um, then I met my business partners and they had worked for Prince at Paisley Park and print and they were musicians. Uh, Mike was a musician and Chuck was a, um, a graphic designer. And Mike was also a sound engineer and he was a, a, a producer and a composer and um, Prince was the one who had them sort of go explore the internet. And I said, I'm from Minneapolis, right? Like you can't live in Minneapolis without having a Prince connection. It makes you not okay. And um, so he was the one who had them start to explore the internet and they were going to create a community for him called the Dawn and um, release that. And uh, they made this really cool um, like bulletin board service, like a threaded discussion space. And it was, it had a really cool graphical interface that reflected um, Paisley Park at the time. And um, he uh, fired them. 
So they took their technology that they had built and they plugged it in in Mike's basement and they started a community of artists and musicians. And ultimately those artists and musicians asked them to give them internet services. So they became an internet service provider and I joined them shortly after that. And we started building websites. So we were, you know, all relative, like I was fresh out of college. They were, um, you know, we were young and dumb and we looked like, um, have you seen that movie Reality Bites? Of course. Yeah. I mean, if you haven't, I have to hang up, but um, that's, we looked like we were right out of that film. Like, you know, we were all these Gen X, like, what are we going to be when we grow up? I don't know what we're going to be, but we're never going to put on real pants. And um, I mean, who's wearing real pants these days? <laughs> right now? Yeah, exactly. Um, and so we had an ISP and we built, uh, we started building websites in 1995. So both of you were infants, I imagine. Yes. No. But we'll, uh, thank you. We'll take that. Okay. We'll say yes. And thank you. (laughs) What I always find is that I'm like this old lady in the internet business. It's ridiculous. Um, But uh, we ended up selling that company in in 2001 and we started Clockwork in 2002. So Clockwork was sort of a, um, you know, it was, it was the moment when we were like, we're not going to sell it. We're going to, you know, we're going to do, we're going to align with our own values. We're going to build a place where we want to work. We're never going to get sucked into, you know, corporate. Um, we're always going to be values driven and connected to the community. We're going to be, um, you know, anti-racist right out of the gate. We're going to be vocal about who we are. We're not going to be afraid of whether or not our clients will love us. And that's sort of how it started. Wow, that's quite a story. Um, so 2002 is when you started and that's the time when you were thinking about all of these things around culture and the values. Um, and it sounds like you, it's just three of you who started the company. I mean, do you have any employees at that time or is it no, just- No, like we all you- did the work. You know, it was like I was selling and doing project management and- um, uh, you know, Mike was an engineer and, um, and Chuck was a, a graphic designer. And so we just did the work and um, Kurt came along and uh, he is also an engineer and Mike was more of a network engineer and Kurt was a software engineer. And then we brought in, um, gosh, I think in our first year, we hired the first maybe two people. Um, but at first it was just us and we weren't even in an office, you know, we were in our basements and we were kind of doing the work and we just started to scale from there. And, and in, in, this is in Minneapolis. So that is, I mean, a small town. It's not like not a hub Thanks. for the business. Right. So how were you doing client acquisition? Like what was the, like, what triggered you that we want to start a company and this business could grow and this, there is a potential Yeah. Well, I think what most people outside of the Twin Cities don't know about Minneapolis is that 3M is here, General Mills is here, Target is here, Honeywell is here. Um, God, that's just scratching the surface. We have more uh, Fortune 5s uh, per capita than any other metropolitan area in the country. So it is not a dumb place to have an agency. Um, And it it was pretty clear to us, Optum is here. I mean, there's huge healthcare organizations here. Um, And I think they all sort of, you know, Pillsbury. I mean, the list is enormous and we've worked with most of them. In fact, probably all of them. You know, right now, uh, 3M is a client, Honeywell is a client, Target is a client. We're working with Optum. We're working with United Healthcare. Ameriprise is here. We're working with them. So, uh, yeah, it it was a strategic decision whether we, you know, um, I mean, that part of it was strategic. When we got um, acquired, um, when our first company got acquired, we were inside of there. We were working with companies all over the country. So at that point, we worked with H.J. Hines and M&M Mars, and we were working with some great companies. And so we, we made, you know, global connections and, and we were able to parlay that into our in opportunities in our backyard. Yeah. And we, we still have clients all over the country. And right now we're working with two or three companies outside of the U S so. Right. So, uh, so I knew uh, right now you are at 50 plus 
people and you do pretty much everything end to end, um, you know, strategy design dev. When you started, how, what was the vision? Like, how did you plan to start an agency and this is what we are going to sell. And then how did you go towards like, like other smaller agencies, they start by selling one or the two things and then they start expanding and they see the opportunity in other areas. Like, would you, how, how did you think about growth and approach to, you know, uh, getting visibility and making you as a specialist in this domain? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think that, uh, you know, every year we try to be mindful and thoughtful about strategy. And I think every year those conversations sort of formulated a roadmap that um, we wanted to sort of deliberately follow. I know, you know, 10 years ago, we were saying we are not websites. We are, um, you know, we're digital business. We are a technology company that modernizes and transforms the clients that we work with. And so we started, it, it's interesting because whenever you have, and you know this, whenever you have, you know, a group of people working together, you can say something, you can say you want something, but actually getting to it takes more time than you imagine. Um, and, and I think we knew pretty early on that we wanted to be a consultancy, um, but we wanted to be lean and nimble and we wanted to do as much architecting of the solutions that we built as delivering the work product itself. Um, and so that was something that we wanted, but, but the product landscape didn't yet exist. And so, you know, we, we sort of, um, rode the wave of demand. So for a long time, I think our clients dictated what we delivered and who we were. And then when we realized that, you know, the verticals we operate in the most are um, healthcare, financial services, um, you know, B2B, um, and, and oftentimes regulated industries. And our background, remember our first company was an ISP. So we had pretty significant um, network experience, which now we call the cloud. So, um, you know, we, we started out offering essentially private cloud services and that evolved to the point where we are this, you know, lean, mean special ops team that our interest is not ever in providing staff hog. Instead, I think what we try to do is, um, uh, we see ourselves as special ops for our clients. You know, we we move quickly, we deliver value um, often, and um, and we try to provide what I like to call digital leadership, because I don't know if you've noticed this, but we see it all the time. Because you know, we also have Accenture here, a big office of Accenture is here, and a big um, component of their um, uh, digital business is here. And um, what we see all the time is now the big consulting firms are hiring people that breathe. And we're able to hire people that think and move very deliberately. And so when we, when we find ourselves working, you know, Cargill is here. That's another big client that nobody really knows about because they're privately held, but they're one of the largest privately held companies on the globe. And every piece of food you touch has probably been touched by Cargill. And um, that was one of our big clients where we worked pretty deeply with Accenture. And what we found was we've been doing this so long and we have such proven methodologies in place and we are capable of flexing and pivoting um, in ways that big machines can't so much so that we're the ones designing that those, those pivots. We're the ones taking these bigger teams from larger organizations along with us and driving versus just augmenting staff. So I think, um, you know, I think a lot of how we moved was organic. A lot of it was dictated by market demand. And a lot of it was, you know, areas of specialty or focus that we evolved into that really made sense for us and where we found our strength, but more, more than anything, where there's existing gaps in the market where the big firms are not delivering or can't deliver and where there's not a lot of, you know, competitive stress um, in, in the space. So I think that's, you know, it, it was a fact, it was a number of factors, but it worked out okay.
So, uh, on those lines, would you do the same thing now if you were to start? I'm thinking from our audience perspective, right? Like they're small, they are starting out. What would be your strategy? What were your learnings from that growth, you know? Um, so that would focus be- Focus first. Yeah, focus first, right? So- yep. Yeah, focus easy, first. Easy said than done, right? I mean, so elaborate more on that. Like, how would you, how would you focus? Like, how do you f- identify like where, how to do it? Yeah, well, I think now you know what I what I see more often than not is the pool of competition is deep, and it's because the you know there there's there's such a, a an enormous amount of opportunity for the skills that we bring to bear. And I think, you know, I just was looking at a site that I wouldn't call a competitor today, but all they do is enable commerce. So it makes it really easy, you know, because I often tell people that sometimes we're limited by the limitations of our prospects or our clients' understandings, because they call us when they need what they think we do, right? And um, and for a long time, I, you know, I, that, that was a limitation. I think when you're able to clearly articulate absolutely what you do and the value that your prospects can expect from that absolute thing, I think it makes it much easier to drive interest in your brand and your offering. Um, so I think, you know, when, when people start, I think the first thing to do is say, you know, when you're building the business plan, which for us was on the back of a napkin because it was 2002, um, I think uh, I think when you're first starting, you have to say, what is it we're trying to accomplish? Like, what do we want? What is the absolute, um, you know, focus of our of our business, and how do we expect to scale that? And I think if you're all good at you know commerce, if you're all good at consulting or strategy, if you're all good at UX and there's just a handful of you and you're founding a thing, you know, focus on what you do. For us, we had come out of this, you know, we were around for the very beginning of the mainstream internet when clients were like, we don't know what we want, but we think we need you, right? So that made for a very loose sort of beginning that we have since tried to narrow. Um, But I think now you know, because it's such a diluted space and there's so much happening there and it's so muddy that the most important thing you can do for prospective clients is be super clear about who you are, what you do and what they can expect from you and what value they can expect to get from your offering. There's a lot you said in there that I want to like backtrack to a quick minute because I feel like there's some learnings and and I'm thinking about the way you described what you learned from your first company in how you've brought that into your second company mm-hmm. as it relates to what you've outlined. You know, uh, my background is in marketing. And so for me, everything comes down to who am I trying to talk to? It's mm-hmm. all based on target audience, brand, all of the stuff. I can build you whatever you want, but if I don't know who I'm talking to, then there's no point. So I love the way that you describe um uh, I had it written down. Of course, I can't find it in my notes right now, but the way that you describe know what you want to do. And yeah. that's, I think it's a, as a, as a new agency, you know, sorry, that's Nacho. Can you hear him? Your dog's name is Nacho. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Sometimes he just barks. There's nothing I can do about it. You know, welcome. He's hungry. It's time to yeah, eat. Yeah, probably. <laughs> um, thinking about kind of you had said something earlier around growing your first company and that clients, and this is, I think, very common. I think I've experienced it, Varun's experienced it, a lot of us have, in that clients ask you to do more. Mm -hmm. And out of that learning, you grew and built and sold. And then you've started this second organization with the feedback of get focused on what you want to do. What if you don't know? What advice would you have for somebody there? I feel like that's the, even tying back to the American dream, what do you want to be when you grow up? That is such a hard question for so many people. What advice or, you know, process or thoughts or would you give to somebody kind of exploring that and trying to figure out how they, how to start specializing? 
Well, I think right now what we what exists that didn't when we were starting is data. You know, there's data, there's opportunity to do market analysis and align what the business world wants, what the business community, what the market wants with what you're capable of or what you have an interest in. So I think to your point, now there's a huge opportunity to actually determine what's missing in the marketplace. Who are we talking to and what do they want? Um, and then how do you align that with strengths? Because I think, you know, I, I do think, um, you know, while I'm not somebody who believes that if you um, love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. I think that's garbage, right? Um, I do that's the believe myth we should have busted too. That that's is the one second one because I agree with that, right? Yeah, <laughs> I bust that in a lot of the talks that I do. I'm like, it's you know, it's baloney. It's still work. It's still work. Work mm -hmm. sucks, and it you sucks in large part because we gotta. There's still, there's still dishes. Exactly. There's still payroll. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, and you know, there are days when I straight up hate my job, but I try not to walk around in that energy because it doesn't serve anybody. But I think um, it is important that you have some emotional connection or some desire to wake up and do it, right? Like mm -hmm. I recognize, like, you know, I, I'm sure that's true with any profession. Like my mom wanted to be a doctor more than anything. She became a doctor. There were days when she hated it, right? But but the the her purpose was what got her up in the morning. And I think um I think you need to find your purpose. And you know, and and your purpose doesn't have to be making the most money or having the biggest clients or making the biggest thing. It can actually be, you know, our purpose when we wrote our mission statement that is still our mission statement today, it was do great work, have great lives. That's our purpose. And it was never make so much money that we're going to sell this thing and be millionaires. It was you know, quality of life matters. And we knew that before that was a conversation that was, you know, that was sort of creating a big rewind, which is what's happening now, right? Like people want better quality of life and it's making us examine our priorities and, and, and we're really sort of um, penned in by the structure of work that has existed forever. And it doesn't matter how cool your company is or whether you work at home or, you know, whether you've had flex time or no vacation caps or all the glorious things that we've been talking about for the next 10 years, it still doesn't change the fact that we work a five-day work week because we always have. Maybe you work a four-day work week, but you're trying to figure out how to make money that equates to five days. And, you know, we work 40-hour weeks and maybe you work 50 or maybe you work 60, but really it's because of that 40-hour, like all the things that we do, we do because we've always done them. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess, you know, I, I sort of feel like it's important that you align your business goals with your personal goals, you know, whatever those are, and then align those with the market. Because that's, I think, where you're going to find some amount of joy in the work that you do. Isn't there, there's a, I'm, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. I had to look it up. That's Einstein said that. And I feel like that resonates to a lot of what you just said, you know, which it's, it's thinking about work differently. It's thinking about life differently. I mean, I feel like there's a whole theme to our conversation, which leads me to my next question. Let's talk about the past year and COVID. How'd you guys do? How'd you fare? How'd you muddle through? It's a conversation we have a, with, I think, every single person we've had on this podcast. Um, talk a lot about hybrid. Are we going back to the office? Are we not going back to the office? How are people feeling about that? And I'd love to hear kind of your thoughts. Before you answer, I think oh, okay. one common theme that we have heard is everybody is so busy. Where is that growth coming from? How, how is it, you know, like, how is, is, how did it work in your industry, in your town, in your city? Like, how is it going on with your life? So, you know, answer that question from that perspective as well. Sure. Um, well, I think before I say everybody's busy, I'm going to say everybody's tired everybody's really tired. And that's something that I notice among my cohorts and my colleagues. Um, the last year um, has been, you know, and we live in Minneapolis, which is the epicenter of, you know, uh, uh, the racial reckoning 
um, that's happening in our country. And it's also, um, you know, I was on a, I was on a meeting recently where um, we were talking about hiring and, and we're actually hearing from people that they don't want to move here, you know, that they would be fine working remote, but the, the mainstream news is painting a picture of Minneapolis that is unfair and untrue. Um, and so it's, it's a, it's not an easy place to be. Um, so remember that, you know, a few months into the, um, pandemic, George Floyd was murdered just a few miles from where I sit right now. So my entire staff was engaged in, um, uh, protesting in the streets, um, cleanup after um, the destruction in the North area and the South in, in South Minneapolis, um, helping to traffic supplies to different communities that were literally um, destroyed or deeply damaged. So, um, you know, volunteering for weeks. I mean, that, you know, the, the news cameras may have gone away in three days, but, but the destruction that came about as a result of that horrendous crime. Um, and he's, in fact, I think at one o'clock, he's getting sentenced. So, um, you know, the, the whole city has been, I mean, we went and got our child from school. They released kids early if they were in person because we didn't know what was gonna happen to our town. Um, and, and listen, I, I believe that we need to rethink policing. So I'm not suggesting that the repercussions of the death of black and brown people, you know, um, manifesting in the destruction of things was um, not exactly what needed to happen. You know, humans value property more than people. And um, so I am, I, I'm just saying, you know, it was an unpredictable year for us in ways beyond the pandemic. Um, and I have a staff who is deeply engaged in social justice, deeply engaged in community and deeply um, impacted by what's happened here over the last year and what continues to happen. Dante Wright was murdered. Um, you know, there was a young man who was murdered uh, just a couple of weeks ago, just sitting in his car with his girlfriend. Um, we have to figure out what to do with police. And I, I bristle at the thought that anybody would say that that's a political discussion. It's a moral and real reality for where we live. So, so our staff is exhausted. They're exhausted because on top of all of that, we had to keep a company alive and pay our bills. And, um, and a lot of them just wanted to go take a nap, go sit in the dark and cry. I'm serious. You know, like it, it was hard to watch and be around and our streets are not desolate. You know, the, 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 the housing market is exploding here. Like it is every place else else, you know, the, the, I just read last night that the average cost of a home in Minneapolis went from $450,000 last year to $550,000 in May. So, um, so the stories that the New York Times are telling, you know, there was a story that came out yesterday that called us a desolate ghost town. Um, not true. It's not true. So it's not serving us. So I only say that to set the stage for the fact that we weren't just dealing with mask wearing and, you know, Trump versus no Trump. We were dealing with a deep amount of pain. Um, and if you've ever been to this city, uh, it's beautiful. It's a go in the in the in the summertime. There is no better place to be, and we never want anyone to find out um, because then they'll move here. Uh, and and it was painful. Um, and then the lies on top of it are hard. So I think my staff is a living, breathing example of you know we didn't lay anybody off. We worked really hard. We probably worked harder than most because we were trying to balance all of that. And yeah, we're busy too. We're really busy. Um, I decided that we were going to go to four day work weeks this summer to give people the three day weekends they need to take a breath and take a nap. Um, and, and we're piloting that to see if we want to do it forever. Um, 
but I think, you know, as an industry, we have to get past hours as an increment of, of value and just sell value, just sell value, just deliver on promises and sell value. So that's, you know, something that's not easy. Um, and, and I think we did the best we could. Um, we had some attrition, we had um, you know, m when we survey our staff, the majority of them think that we handled this as well as anybody could have. Um, we made space for people to grieve as they dealt with all of the stuff happening in the city. We made space for people to do what they needed to do to help in their communities. Um, and now we're just trying to come back. I mean, we have been really busy, but we did take a hit because Minneapolis was in pain. Um, so now we're trying to come back. And I think after the summer we will because there's so much work to be done. And I think the reason for that is people are being forced to digitally transform faster. So now it's not transformation, it's acceleration. And I think everybody's feeling the pressure to figure out what's next. And that's where we come in to help them do it. We are changing. We're doing, you know, I, I don't think we've always been, you know, flexible schedules, remote if you want, but I think people change that a little bit. You know, if you have a staff full of people that like being together and you have a fun building and people like to be in it, it creates an energy where there's uh, unspoken expectation. But um, when everybody went home, they were like, you know what, I kind of like this, I'm going to stay here. We used to have two buildings as of the end of this month, we only will have one. Um, not, and I think we had too much space, you know, I had 22,000 square feet. Um, yeah, right. We didn't, we didn't need it, but we used it for collaboration spaces and events and all sorts of stuff. We're not going to do that anymore. We're going to go down to one building. It's going to be handled like a co-working space. People will check out collaboration spaces and, uh, and most of us will probably work from home. Um, so we're dealing with all the same changes as anybody else and trying to navigate culture on Zoom. Um, I think it opens up the talent pool for us just like anybody else because now, you know, I think people were more reticent because maybe we were more together. So they were more reticent to apply if they were, you know, based in other places. But now, you know, we're hiring people from all over the country and just hired somebody from Chicago and Houston and, um, and that feels good. So all the changes you've probably heard from everybody else, except layer in the realities of living in the city where it's happening. Yeah, I, uh, I thank you for sharing that. I think that's some really good, honestly, some good perspective. I think we, you know, there was so much and that happened this past year. It's so much. I don't know how to end that sentence to be perfectly honest with you. Mm -hmm. We forget the pieces of all the so much, you know, how it affected us personally, how it affected us in our larger communities, how it affected others elsewhere. So um, I think, I, I thank you for sharing a lot of that unique perspective and thank you to your staff. Also, I will say that, you know, I, we're, we're located out in Boston. We have our own set of crazy challenges out here, but you know, this past year, you guys needed our love and support. So we're sending it right thank to the podcast. You. So, um, that leads me, I, I, I'm going to lead us back to some, so a little <laughs> bit more lighter of a question, if that's okay with everybody. Sure. <laughs> um, so, you know, you talked a lot about your staff and kind of what they've gone through. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, hiring. This it tends to be a hot topic um, amongst agency people, you know, especially with the change you brought it up, even you're looking a little bit more nationally focused and hiring in general. And the job market is insane right now you know, talk to us a little bit about, and I'm sure Varun, if it has more specific way of asking these questions, I have a, a tendency to go more general, but. Um, Usually what, what we um, ask is, um, especially after COVID, things have changed on hiring, right? So you, and you also talked about how you um, started approaching, you know, people from different towns and cities. Um, the, the, the big discussion these days that we are hearing um, among agency owners is uh, on this topic of using subcontractors, not in this country, but also going near shore, offshore as well. You know, um, there are agencies who have never done that in the past, which are opening up to go to different countries to, you know, um, 
get better support, uh, increase their capability, capacity, and the profit margins. So um, how have you approached in the past and how are you planning to approach going forward, especially what has happened in, in, in the last year? Um, so yeah. your thoughts. Um, we generally, in the past, we did not have a practice of outsourcing at all. Um, this last year, as we were sort of um, determining what was ahead for us, we did partner with organizations from inside the Bureau that we respect and appreciate and have good relationships with. So, um, you know, in the last um, few months, we've worked a lot with Chromatic in Chicago. And, you know, those guys are great. We have a similar value set. I am really uh, very hesitant to, to outsource to offshore. And the reason for that is I've been bit in the butt um, on more than one occasion in, you know, in the very early days and in our last company and working with corporate entities who have believed that they could save themselves, you know, enormous amounts of money. And what they've done is create enormous amounts of headache. Um, and it's generally, you know, communication and time, you know, the time difference and issues and just not being able to eyeball people. So for me, um, and I, there's just something that I can't get my head around. Um, and I don't, I don't really know what it is. It's not, uh, I, I guess it's a, I think the relationships and the work that we do are more essential than ever. And, um, and, and that's true for the, the functional aspects of the work that we build. Um, and so, just throwing that over a fence and hoping we understand each other because we've outlined, you know, requirements or, um, you know, we've had lengthy conversations or we've delivered user stories or whatever. I, it's just never been exactly what we want. And in the end, I don't think the money, I don't think you really save the kind of money that, you know, you expect to. And, um, so for me, uh, I think we're open to partnerships um, when they make sense. I will always lean on our friends at Chromatic. Um, there's another couple of smaller bureau shops that we use, and I really appreciate those relationships, but we don't offshore as a rule. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that's, it's like, you know, there are agencies who never done that. And I totally um, hear you loud and clear, like, you know, they're, are a lot of bad apples like you know so those experiences can basically set the tone of how you're going to uh, work in the future and how your thoughts and tendency toward uh, this whole concept of offshoring um, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear also that you know you do work with other smaller shops as and when the uh, you know time and need arises mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, and they're accessible and they're accountable. Like, listen, I know I can fly to Chicago and choke Dave at Chromatic if I need to, but you know, I, I, I you know, nameless, faceless engineers from, you know, shops in all corners, they're just not as accessible. And so I think it changes the accountability. I think that's the issue for me. Um, you know, I, 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 I need to know that when we approach the, cause you know, for our clients right now, it's, it's big stuff. You know, we've got a couple of clients that are changing how they do business pretty dramatically. It's big stuff. They're investing significantly, um, you know, for a reason, it's a defining moment in their history yeah. and to, throw their this defining moment over the fence and hope that this person I have no relationship with this yeah. team I have no and has no real attachment you know to the end goal um that seems to me to be irresponsible and that's not judgment that's how I feel I don't you know how anybody else if they've managed to create relationships with folks. You know, last year, I, I, uh, last year, I guess it was before the pandemic, I had a relationship with, um, you know, a, a, I met a, a group that had a pretty, um, uh, evolved, um, uh, crew in Croatia. So they were offshoring to Croatia. They had a couple of folks on their leadership team who were Croatian 
and manage those relationships and in fact new people in Croatia who were part of those teams. Totally different deal. But they were able to scale super fast, right? Because they had $10 an hour engineers in Croatia. And so they were able to do what I could never do, but it's because they were able to have those relationships. So maybe if, you know, at some point in our growth, um, we have somebody on the leadership team who has those pre-existing relationships where they bring the accountability, the conversation and the trust. Uh, cool. Yeah. So I, I won't rule it out forever, but I just have not found that relationship. You know, and, and what you're saying is, is absolutely true. Like we, uh, you know, we've been, um, I look at it from the other side as well. This is what we do. We have, you know, offshore business and we work with a lot of agencies and other clients and we have seen this happening in our company as well. We have been those offshore shops who have screwed up multiple times and have burned, you know, and have taken them off and then made them angry and things have not gone our way. But um, so, I, so I totally agree you know, what happens, um, you know, you don't know and you don't know the people, which is where the relationship, as you rightly said, you know, is the most important aspect of any, any collaboration. Mm -hmm. People, how, who they are, how they work. So that is the first thing that you would want to do even in any relationship, whether it's here or offshore. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I have one final question. <laughs> what keeps you up at night? the co-founder, CEO, agency owner? Hmm. Um, well, my son is black. So if I, it's not work at all. It's the future of humanity and whether or not we'll find our humanity. Um, you know, the stuff that keeps me up at night, it used to be work. It used to be Oh God, can I pay these people? Oh God, is this client coming? Oh God, are we going to sell this thing? Oh God. It's, you know, it's funny because even now when I have a moment where I'm like, Oh God, I will talk to Chuck, my business partner. And I'll be like, we're going to, we've been fine for 20 years. We're going to be fine. You know, this is going to happen. You know, we have a slow month. We pull through it. We have a too busy month. We deal with it. There's not a problem in the realm of digital work that I haven't, dealt with. And so I know I can do that. Um, but I have a 15 year old son, uh, who's going to be driving in a year and I live in Minneapolis. That's what keeps me up. And I'm sorry to be a drag on your podcast. <laughs> You're like, let's just put this one in a drawer and we never have to publish it. Um, but it's true. I mean, I think, you know, I think there's no separation between the Nancy that, you know, works with clients every day and, 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 and my teams every day and the person who loses sleep because I have a person in my life who I love more than myself. And I, I fear for their future. And, you know, if we don't get our proverbial crap together in this country, I, I don't have a reason to sleep. Um, so that's what keeps me up at night that, and, you know, um, interpersonal stuff, you know, I, I mean, wherever you, you know, wherever there are people, there are problems. So the stuff I actually probably perseverate around too much is people who are struggling in their, in their roles. You know, that's the stuff that, you know, what have we missed? What haven't we given them? What, are, where haven't we coached them? Where, you know, it's never the revenue stuff anymore. It's never the, you know, the mortgage or the, it's not that stuff anymore. It's, it's people and do they have what they need to succeed? And, and well, talking about people, I know you wrote a book on the people. You want to talk about that for a few minutes? Yeah, I'd love to. I wrote a book. Oh, it's up there. I wrote a book called work like a boss and I wrote it. Um, interestingly, when, now that, now that we're here, you see that there are themes that I'm interested in. And that book is about personal accountability. I think that, um, we, especially now in a post pandemic world, people that take initiative and hold themselves accountable are the most valuable people that we can invite into our organizations. But I don't know that most of them have been trained um, in their work lives to recognize their own power. 
Um, I think that uh, most humans abdicate responsibility for how culture feels and how successful a product is or whatever to leadership, right? They're, they, they, they respond to a job description. I am checking these boxes. I have done this thing. But what we need them to do is look, is ideate and be part of innovation and look outside of the job description to see how they show up and recognize how their energy impacts other people at work and recognize that you know, people tend to default to negativity and that serves nobody. Like, you know, I think, I think showing up, being ready to support one another, to encourage one another, you know, showing up um, interested in learning, open to failure, um, you know, and, and willing to try something you've never tried before or willing to risk, um, you know, your position or your, um, you know, your, your reputation or your ego um, to be involved in something or putting your neck out. And, you know, one of the points that I try to make in the book is, you know, we glorify entrepreneurship, but what we really need right now is intrapreneurs. You know, you may not want to own the company, but you have to think like an owner. And when I say that, I mean, be able and willing to make a decision and be willing to put yourself out there and try something new. And, you know, I, I talk about that French word entrepreneur. Entrepreneur means to do something. So really the only difference between entrepreneurs and everybody else is we did something. We did it. And most people, you know, I you you mentioned in the intro that I was on NBC News and we were interviewed by um, Cynthia McFadden and she, you know, what used to be that uh, the the anchor for Nightline. I was just watching a, a episode of Dateline the other day like an old one on demand mm -hmm. or something and she was the host and she was talking to like I've, I've seen her interview Hillary Clinton. When she left interviewing me, she was going to interview um, Schultz, the CEO of Starbucks at the time. And she was like getting on a plane to go interview him. And I was like, wow, this is weird. And, um, and she said to me, you know, tell me how you started. How did this all happen? And she said, you know, I've always wanted to start my own business, but, um, but I didn't have the courage. And I was like, what? Like you go into war-torn countries and you interview dictators and, and, and you're afraid to start your, like all I did was sign some papers and throw a few bucks on a table. And suddenly I was, you know, I was a business owner. Like it, you know, it doesn't take that much courage. It probably takes more stupidity when you're bootstrapping. And um, I was sort of stunned. And, you know, that, that is, the basis for how I feel about the people that are most valuable to me in my work. Like, I don't know more than them. They know more than me. I just need them to use that energy and that knowledge, you know, in the right ways and to really channel it productively and to do something. So the book is really about that. It's about bringing your best self to work and showing up willing and ready and, and not being afraid and not being negative and, you know, I think we talk a lot about technology and money in our capitalist society. We don't talk enough about the people and what they need and how we need them to show up and what our expectations are. And when we talk about digital transformation and why it's so hard, and this is the talk you saw me do, um, you know, we really need to pay closer attention to the people. You know, humans have a hard time changing. That's why this stuff is so hard. That's why technology initiatives fail. You know, I say to people all the time, technology exists. Like we can make robots that, that we could marry. They look so realistic, you know? Like we can put people on Mars. We can put cameras on Mars and watch it from here. We can, you know, there's nothing we can't do with technology. Technology is getting there. Um, people aren't. And we need to spend more time thinking about what they need. Um, to show up better and to support the technology so that we really move in the direction we do. I mean, you must have clients that you feel that way about where you're like, oh my God. You know, people say to me, you don't work at a big company. How can you say these things? Because I work with them every day and they're all clown cars. Mm -hmm. You know, how they get anything done. Do you ever walk, like get done with your day and think, dear God, I'm glad I work here and not there. Yeah, you know, okay. like how do they do anything? <laughs> Seriously. Right. But this is a whole nother episode that we're diving into right here. Like a whole, uh, like a whole nother series. Are you inviting me back? Oh, uh, sure. <laughs> I think we need to start a whole separate conversation on the side right. of this outside of this one, you know, going back to your original point, we want to make sure we stay targeted and who we're trying to talk to. On yeah. Our, yeah. On yeah. Terms. So, um, 
How'd you like that for tying a full circle and I liked it. that sucker? Well, so the book, the book is called Work Like a Boss, available at worklikeaboss.com for those of it you. It is. Listening. I'm going to give you a picture oh. of it. I can show it to you. Here it is. Oh, great. Can you see oh. it? Can you... Nope. No. Oh, no. now we can. All right. Yep, good. Work Like a Boss. So for those of you watching the YouTube, yeah. you can see it. So this was great. Thank you so much, Nancy, for joining us. Um, it's very interesting. You never know where these conversations are going to go sometimes. So we appreciate your perspective. Are you going to put it in a box and never air it? No, we'll, we'll put it out there. <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just kidding. Yes, of course. I, um, so where people can find you is on the LinkedIn, on the Twitter, your company website, which is clockwork.com, your personal website, which is nancylyons.com spelled with a Y and work like a boss, as we mentioned. So thank you so much. Yeah. And, thank you for having me. Uh, that's it, everyone. If you've learned something today or laugh, tell something about the podcast. Rock on. Thanks for listening. Find our other episodes on agencies that build.com. Plus we're listed anywhere you find your favorite podcast.